Uh, good morning, everybody. How are we feeling on day three of Vancouver and uh, Vancouver ODS? Good parties last night. Thank you, HP. It was a great, great party. Um, also to Intel. And uh, as I said this morning to a couple of colleagues, you know, friends don't let stackers turn up to day three or leave the hotel without your pass. My, my, my roommate let me let leave the hotel without my pass. <laughs> bad, bad, bad. Okay, <laughs> we have got a really exciting a whole day today of news about what we're doing in the OpenStack community um, here at Ubuntu. Um, and to kick us off, um, we're going to be doing a session on, on LexD and KVM. Um, but I, I just want to do a quick show of hands. Um, how many people in the room have presently got OpenStack okay. in production? That's fantastic. So almost half the room. Um, how many people here are using Ubuntu OpenStack or Ubuntu as the base for their OpenStack cloud? Don't be shy. So about half the room. That's about right. That's what we're expecting. Um, you know, the data was out on Monday. 55% of OpenStack deployments now being done on Ubuntu. I've been told to talk into a mic. Yes. 50% of, of ah. OpenStack deployments now being done um, on Ubuntu. And critically, so many of the large clouds. And if you were there on Monday, Comcast, Walmart, um, uh, Digital Film Tree, um, all talking about how they're using Ubuntu as the base for their OpenStack deployments. So it's great to have you here for what we think is the biggest breakthrough in virtualization since virtualization started. And I'm going to hand over to, um, to James and team who leads our OpenStack architecture um, uh, at Canonical to talk through LexD and KVM and uh, why we think this is so exciting. James. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. Excellent. So um, let me just uh, get set and then we can, we can go. <laughs> Technology's already failing me. There we go. Right, okay. Um, so just a quick introduction as to who I am and, and who my colleague Ryan is. So uh, my name's James Page. I'm technical architect of the Ubuntu OpenStack team. I've been with Canonical for about four and a half years now, but I've been deploying and working with open source technologies for about 15 years in fairly large enterprises before Canonical. Um, I, I lead the team who's responsible for all of the packaging that you use for Ubuntu OpenStack and for all of the charms that uh, we deliver for deploying OpenStack using uh, our Juju service orchestration tool. I'll, I'll hand over to Ryan to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Ryan Harper. Um, I've been with Canonical about one and a half years uh, on the Ubuntu server team, technical lead there. Um, and prior to that, I was at IBM's Linux Technology Center, and I've been working on uh, uh, virtualization, open source virtualization, for about 12 years there. OK, so um, before we dig into some benchmarking figures that Ryan's going to run us through, I'm going to uh, take you through um, our products and, and uh, around containerization and the work we've done in the last six months since Paris when we announced LexD, our, our new uh, light advisor product. Um, so what's LexD? Um, LexD is, um, as I said, it's our, our light advisor. It's, it's designed to run full machine containers. Um, so we're differentiating from things like Docker and Rocket, which are very much around running process-based containers. It's a full machine container. And I'll, I'll dig into that in a little bit more detail. We're very much targeting getting close or at bare metal performance for those containers. Um, so as a little as possible between your workload and the underlying hardware you're running on. Um, that allows us to achieve some very high density figures uh, for the number of containers you can run on a, 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 a certain specification of hardware uh, due to a very, very small overhead um, for, for each container. Um, so let, let's dig into what that machine container terminology means compared to process containers in a bit more detail. So, um, in, the, in the slide I've just, just popped up, we've got a um, host machine, either bare metal or KVM. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk bare metal for purposes of this, uh, this talk. But, and we've got a couple of containers deployed on it. And e each of those containers feels very much like uh, a full system. Um, so they're running a standard, trusty or vivid uh, Linux um, image. Uh, you've got init running, you've got cron, syslog, you can SSH to it. Um, it feels very much like a full virtual machine that you would get under KVM. And, and that, that's the parity we're looking to achieve with LexD. Uh, we're not trying to compete with Docker. And in fact, it can include Docker within that. So it's perfectly feasible to run a number of process containers within a machine container and, and have a, a level of nested containerization uh, to give you more flexibility if you want to do that as well. OK, so kind of digging into LexD features in a, in a bit more detail. 
Um, some of you have, uh, may have seen uh, my colleague Tycho's um, uh, Doom live migration demo from, from Paris, where he uh, live migrated a, a running uh, Doom demo for, uh, b b between, uh, between machines. And, and we've been doing quite a lot of work on that in the last six months uh, to, to leverage uh, CRIU, the Checkpoint Restore and User Space uh, toolset, to, to perform smooth, fast, and reliable live migration. So still, there's still a little bit of work to go on that, which I'll touch on later in the, in the talk. Um, but if, if you haven't seen that demo, please go, do go down to our booth in the Expo Hall, where that's running all the time. And you can, uh, you can see the, uh, uh, the fantastic li uh, Doom Live migra migration running. Um, got a, a real strong focus on security. Um, so by, by leveraging a, a number of security technologies, um, we're able to, to deliver unprivileged containers. Um, so these are containers where all of the processes within that container are running not as root. Um, and this is very important in terms of uh, the, the security around our container architecture. So by, by, by doing that, we're, we're able to um, provide an increased level of assurance that um, if, uh, God forbid, a container breakout did happen, then that's as an unprivileged user on the host. So the, the, the impact of such a, a possibility is, is much reduced. Um, but, you know, to, to kind of beef up around that, we're leveraging a number of um, uh, well-known technologies. Uh, AppArmor in Ubuntu is, is very much used to, to enforce security about what the processes within a container, a running container can do on the host OS. And we're working with uh, most of the um, major uh, instruction set um, owners uh, in terms of um, enabling hardware assist for, for container security as well. That's not something that's generally available, but as and when it uh, becomes um, more consumable, um, that's something that we'll be delivering as, as part of LexD. Okay, so touching on another couple of things, uh, networking and storage. So the approach we've taken with LexD is, is basically if it can be presented on the host, we can plug it in a container. So uh, we're, not, we're not doing any heavy lifting in terms of integrating with something like OpenV switch or any SDNs or specific um, storage solutions. We're taking the approach that if you can present it on the OS, host OS, it can then be consumed within the containers that you're running on top of that OS. Um, so we're, we're avoiding the heavy lifting in LexD. Fortunately, we have quite a well-known cloud product, which does a lot of that for us. Um, so it, this fits nicely alongside something like OpenStack to, to provide you know, the, the networking and, and storage components into a container architecture, which leads me quite neatly on to uh, the other project we've been working on in the, in the last six months, which is our, our Nova Compute LexD driver. Um, so this is a drop-in replacement driver for, say, the LibVirt KVM driver that allows you to manage LexD containers in an OpenStack cloud in a very similar way to, to, to KVM instances. Um, it, it's, um, we've got a, a preview, technical preview release out with our uh, Ubuntu 15.04, which came out last month. Um, and, and in that, we've got um, some, some support for fast root FS cloning. Uh, we run everything by default as unprivileged containers to, to assure a level of security. Uh, we've got a base level of Neutron integration with the ML2 OVS reference implementation. Uh, we're fully integrated with Glance, so you can store your LexD root tables in, in Glance and, and use those across your cloud just in the same way as you would do for, for LibVirt KVM. And we've enabled support for LexD in our, in our GGTARM for, for Nova Compute. And it literally is just a single config option to switch between KVM and LexD as the, the two options. And that allows you to deploy an entire OpenStack cloud um, using their um, LexD containers underneath the hood. OK, so I'm going to hand you over to Ryan now. He's going to walk you through some of the detail of containers and some of the benchmarking we've been doing. Thanks, James. So. <coughs> What is in the way of the workload? Um, let's get started on that. So what we have here is kind of a layered picture showing um, how we're stacking things together. We've got our physical machine. You boot your Ubuntu Linux kernel, put Ubuntu Linux on top of it. And on the left, uh, if we start up a KVM instance, um, virtual machines are meant to look very much like bare metal. And so they have all the same things that your bare metal system had. It has a BIOS. It has a bootloader. It's going to load its kernel. Uh, and it's going to run through its operating system, user space, come up. And then you get to the point where you can run your workload. Um, there's lots of uh, extra stuff that happens to you know, simulate that machine in the kernel. It's still probing virtual devices, emulated devices, doing all these things. And that has to happen because it wants to behave like a, uh, a real machine. Uh, in LexD, we don't have any of that. The containers run 
as processes directly on the, the host as processes. Um, we do go straight to init, but we don't have uh, a, a BIOS, we don't have device drivers or things like that. So that makes uh, things a lot thinner. Um, so if your application's running in the virtual machine, a couple things have to happen before it starts to run. Um, when your application is running, the, the virtual processor in the KVM needs to schedule your workload process. The host itself needs to schedule the virtual processor to run as well. Um, and so a lot of this introduces just extra time and latency and overhead to actually running what you need to get done. Um, so there's a couple of interesting things that happen on large SMP guests as well as um, overcommitted hosts. Um, the host operating system, the Linux kernel, has to help provide some switching between all these different virtual processes. Um, and in the pure uh, virtual machine world, we talk about a problem called lock holder preemption, um, where your, uh, your guest OS is holding a lock while your other parts of your workload may need to do some work, but it's not actually being scheduled by the host. Um, and this is actually a big deal. The silicon vendors have introduced features to detect this particular situation and tell the hypervisor, by the way, uh, you're not gonna get any further with this particular one. Why don't you schedule something else? So for, for LexD, this, this is not a problem. And without having lots of extra layers of uh, resources being occupied, that leaves LexD to do things um, quite well. Uh, let's look at that. So density, um, just from a memory footprint perspective, um, our, uh, we don't have you know, all those extra stacks in that layer in that picture, um, so we can put a lot more of these uh, machine containers on the same system, and this means that we can do more with the hardware that you have. You can pack more into there. And this increases our utilization. So we intuitively we kind of knew this, right? Containers aren't as heavyweight as the virtual machines, um, but we really wanted to kind of take some time and say, well, let's put some, some numbers next to this. And so to get a real number, we took an Intel server, four core, 16 gigs, um, pretty, pretty stock setup, and uh, we set up Ubuntu um, Linux on it. And we decided we'll just we'll launch KVM instances um, with Ubuntu server image, and we'll do this until the hypervisor is out of resources. In this case, the one that we're most constrained with is, is RAM. So we'll do that, boot up as many as we can until we can't anymore, record that, and then we'll do the same thing with LexD, using the exact same uh, image, but using the LexD uh, virtualization technology. So let's take a look at that. On the left, <laughs> the, uh, we, we launched uh, about 36 containers. This is another run where we got a, a few more. Um, and uh, and that, was, that was what we expected. These were five 12 megabyte virtual machines. Um, you know, they boot up and you know, KSM's active and doing some work to deduplicate, you know, deduplicate pages. You know, but at some point, just all that, that overhead that, that happens, these are all full guest OSs with that big stack. Remember that big stack that's got everything in there? It just takes up space. Uh, so we re-ran with LexD's basically exact same uh, you know, experiment, but with containers where each container, machine container, just has dramatically less memory footprint from each one. And so with that, we uh, had a dramatic number here, over 600 of the same Ubuntu images are running on this same server. So that was extremely impressive. Um, now, um, now that we, we, we saw this and we said this is really good, but let's, let's take this and put it in the context of the cloud. So if I can take a single server and stack very, very, very many mach you know, LexD machine containers, and then for the cloud, that means we should have some significant density. So we built a 10-node uh, uh, OpenStack Kilo cloud on Intel servers, a little bit bigger. Uh, I think there were six, six cores um, and 48 gigs of RAM on them, and then we, we ran in a uh, converged architecture, so a lot of the infrastructure was housed on some nodes, and that gave us about six compute nodes uh, for us to run this experiment. And we did it with KVM, and then we did it with LexD, the Nova NC LexD driver. Um, so let's look, look at where we got. 
Now, some explanation for the graphs. These are um, ganglia uh, monitoring graphs that we grabbed while we were running a boot test. So we just kick off a Nova instance and keep it going, and just keep it going until the, the cloud kind of falls apart. Um, the blue in the charts represents committed memory. So that is memory that's been allocated um, to the, from the host perspective, it's allocated to running applications and processes. The green represents uh, cached memory, buffer cache, page cache, things that Linux does to speed things up for read and write op operations and things like that. Um, there's one more color, um, purple, on the lower right on KVM indicates swap. So that's when we've started committing uh, memory that's not being actively used and touched into swap. Um, and things get noticeably slower when we get in there. So on the, on the KVM side, we, uh, we had about, um, about around 1,000 instances or so is when we kind of hit the red line in there and we started getting into swap. And it continued to swap and uh, we committed another, f I think it's another 48 gigs or so above to get that last remain. Uh, uh, and we started swapping when she said, all right, we just, we'll kill it now. We can't get any further with that. Um, and we re-ran with, uh, with LexD. And as we were getting up, I think it was around, um, uh, it was about maybe 1,200, 1,300 instances. You know, we we're steadily increasing, and it was, it was good to see this memory footprint where we have tons of greens. Just as we have a huge amount of headroom where we can continue making containers, and uh, we kind of we flatlined for a little bit. You may be able to see under the 1,800. There's a bit of a, a flat line, and uh, the benchmark came back and said, I, "I can't allocate. I've got a resource problem." And I said, "Well, I'm looking at the chart here. And it's like there's plenty of RAM left." So. I was talking with James and said, James, why, what's, what's going on here with this, with this flat line? Yeah. What, was, what was happening? Yeah. So it, it turned out we'd, um, we'd hit the, 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 the scheduler limit. So the, the scheduler was saying, actually, the compute host has got no more memory. Um, so the, the default RAM and memory allocation limits that we ran the test with weren't sufficient to deal with the, the density of containers that we could get on each compute host. So uh, we actually just twiddled those knobs, increased the, the overcommit. Um, a lot so that we didn't hit it again, and, and, and the cloud started creating instances again. So um, it, it just shows that um, the difference between, you know, we didn't hit that on the KVM test. I think we probably would have seen it at about 1,400 instances with the, 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 the configuration we were running. Um, but we hit that, that relatively rapidly with the, the, con the, the container test. And um, we just had to tweak that up and, and allow a higher level of overcommit on each host. Um, so, so once we once we fix the overcommit ratios and set them rather high, thousand or something, just keep on going. Uh, it continued to climb on the web. We we ended up cutting off about 1,800 instances or so as the the infrastructure convergence infrastructure was just making the spawning really slow. And so we said, I think we've covered, and the picture kind of shows exactly what we wanted to show in terms of uh, how um, frugal LexD is with uh, memory resources. Um, so um, another feature, something that matters, is uh, startup time for developers, right? If you're iterating on a project or a workload or whatever, the f you can go through your workflow faster and faster if you're not waiting on things to happen. I mean, how many people have rebooted a physical machine and you're waiting for the five minutes for the enterprise firmware to finish probing devices just to get to the bootloader and run? And virtual machines are certainly faster, um, but <laughs> LexD, remember that picture that we drew, we don't have that virtual BIOS, we don't have another bootloader, another kernel to load and run, we're right into the workload immediately. And so this means startup time is dramatically different. So, LexD, launch, Ubuntu, VM1, 1.5 seconds, and we're in, we're running, right? All the processes that you saw earlier are already going, you can SSH in, that's there. For the same KVM instance, we've got to go through all those things in that stack to get all the way up and finish its init, and then we're in there. So that makes a big impact for, for workflows. Um, and so, um, if you recall, the first density test that we did, um, we took some, we, and, and you look at this, this, this startup time, um, we went back and looked at the time it took to do the density run. So when we launched the 36 or so of the uh, uh, KVM instances, we kept how long did it take for us to, to actually get that far. And then for the much higher, you know, over 500 um, for the uh, LexD containers, we looked at the time it took to get there. Um, so same server, 
launched uh, their 37 in 943 seconds, and then um, when we launched, we, it was amazing to see that we had launched more than 14 times the number of instances, but in less time, about 20% less time than KVM. So startup time matters, and the density matters, and that really combines for some, some powerful uh, technology. Uh, I want to talk about another LexD feature when you think about that stack and how thin it is and what this enables. Latency. So latency is important for many workloads. So telcos are very much interested in reducing the amount of time it takes to respond for message passaging and things like that. Um, you know, even in an open stack cluster where we're sending messages all across the bus, latency can make a uh, tremendous impact on the speed of, of your cloud and, and how quickly you can react. So we did a benchmark here. Um, so we looked at the uh, zero MQ as a latency benchmark. And uh, so we set this up. Um, the remote latency setup here is two KVM on the top. We have two KVM VMs running Ubuntu. Um, they're on the same host, on the same software bridge. Um, and uh, the test itself um, sends one byte packets, a million of them, and then averages the latency across at the time it took for each one of those as well. And uh, in this case, you know, uh, one of the KVM guests, when the test start, needs to send the packet. This is going to go through, you know, the networking layer of our IO net. It's going to go down into the host, take the packet, goes to the bridge. It's on the bridge, comes back up into the other guest. It has to wake up and be scheduled and picked and then sent into the user space, and then you get a response. And so that can take a long time. Um, exact same setup with LexD to uh, container machines on a shared bridge running the exact same test, and we're over 50% less latent. And that's just, there's not as much in that stack that we have to go through, which means that your applications can communicate at a significantly faster. Um, the other test here, the local latency, takes the software path, or the, the, the networking part of the pass. It's just the application talking to itself um, in two threads, and it was Interesting to see the local latency on the bottom looks to me um, scheduling latency, right? We have two, two threads inside your uh, virtual machine that need to be scheduled and context switched between. And we see a lot of the uh, you know, context switch overhead that you'll get in a virtual machine when we have to do VM exits or you've got two schedulers and you've got to make sure that it happens uh, quite right. In LexD containers, we don't have that extra layer or extra kernel or extra scheduler. It's just the same you know, processes on, on the host. And so we saw the same 50 plus percent latency improvement uh, on there. So before I hand it back, just wanted to cover um, some of these key benefits, right? So you think about that picture about how much we're taking out, but still giving you a full machine container and delivers, you know, these, these key, key capabilities, right? Density, right? We use less memory per system than you will with a KVM machine. That means you can stack more things together. Startup time, so your workflow, how quickly you can run through things, how you, how you get through these processes has a significant impact on, on, on workflows. Uh, and finally, latency, right? These, for folks who are interested in high-speed workloads that require very quick response times, getting that, all that stuff out of the way of your workload means that you'll be able to get more of what you need done faster. Okay, thanks, thanks. Ryan. So, uh, as, I, as I detailed below, we've got a technical preview release out with our, our Ubuntu 15.04 release. Uh, so if you want to try it now, you can go and try it on 15.04. We're obviously not recommending this for production use yet. We've got a, we've got a number of features that we, we want to work on and implement before, before we're recommending that people start using this stuff in production. And, and our target there is really around our 16.04 LTS. So this time next year, we'll have our, our successor to, to Trusty out uh, for, for 16.04 in April. And, and we're aiming for a rock solid container story with OpenStack at that point in time. So test now, give us feedback, tell us what's rubbish, what's good. And, and uh, we'll definitely work on, 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 on the results of that feedback. But in terms of what we've generally got on the roadmap, uh, we have an integrated roadmap between the, the LexD team and the, the, the guys writing the Nova Compute LexD driver. Um, and we've got, a, we've got a few things that we're targeting over, over the next 12 months. So uh, full block device support uh, to allow better integration is, is top of the list right now. Uh, we're not able to directly um, present a block device into uh, a LexD container right now. So we can't, for example, 
provision a Ceph RBD volume and then map that into a LexD container right now. But that's something that we feel um, for kind of parity with KVM and Libvirt, that's something we absolutely need. So that machine container experience feels the same for LexD and, and for KVM and, 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 and allows you know, a much more comparative uh, feel to, to the solution. So that, that's a, a high target for us. Uh, broader Neutron SDN support um, is part of our work with, in the OpenStack Interop Lab. We're working with a number of SDN partners. Um, all who have expressed um, interest in, in, in LexD and, and, and helping us enable their, their particular SDN in Neutron um, to, to work with LexD containers. So I've got a, a, a series of, pro, of, of work there to, to enable things like Contrail, stuff like that. Uh, broader image format support. So LexD is currently constrained to using a root tarball format, which if you use a cloud regularly is not what you use. You're typically using a raw image or a QCAL or something like that. Um, LexD itself is going to be growing support to support a wider range of formats. So um, we'll get that natively via LexD. So if you're using LexD standalone or as part of a cloud, you'll be able to use the standard uh, QKR2 image that you, you're familiar with using with Ubuntu on KVM, but with LexD containers as well. Um, I, we alluded to this during the, 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 the performance, uh, the performance of entrance we talked about, especially around density and the fact that we lit, hit the uh, the scheduler limits pretty quickly with containers. So um, kind of resource management and usage reporting back into to Nova is, again, another key focus. So figuring out how we, we represent um, the lighter footprint of a container back into, into Nova and how we manage that more effectively. So how we limit a container to, say, only being able to consume a couple of cores or a, a certain percentage of the memory of the, of the host. Uh, they're all features that are coming in LexD to be able to constrain containers and have a container know it's only got a certain footprint. It's only got two cores, it's only got half a gig of memory. That's a that's feature that isn't in LexD in the compute driver right now, but that's something that's coming over the next two releases. Um, and full live migration support. So we, we can do live migration now. Um, there are some bits that don't get live migrated, mainly the security bits. So um, Tyco's been working on that to, to make sure that when you live migrate a container, you, the, the security around it also gets live migrated as well. So that, that's the broad roadmap we got between um, now and 1604. I hope you can, you can see how we've, we've come in the last six months to, to, to have an initial product for our 1504 release and, and where we're going in the next 12 months. Um, it's pretty exciting. Um, I think it's a very compelling story, especially when you look at, start looking at the latency figures. Uh, that, 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 that Brian highlighted and, and how much closer you can get a, a workload, whether that's a, you know, a, a virtual network appliance or a big data workload, you can get it right down next to the bare metal and get that me bare metal performance, but still have the, the usability of a, um, a cloud like OpenStack. Okay, so um, we've got 10 minutes or so for, for, for questions. I'm hoping there might be some. Um, so if, if anybody wants to ask a question, we've got some mics. I can see what I can see. You got one of what are the guest OS limitations? So um, right now, um, if you want to do anything that requires interaction with the kernel from within the guest, uh, that you basically can't do that. So running something like Open vSwitch within a container is is not possible today. Um, I think we're going to look about how far we can push that limit. So there is always going to be some limit on a container compared to a full KVM because you don't have a dedicated kernel. So it's sometimes not safe to, to, to permit those operations from within a container. Um, so that, that's one key difference. I, I alluded to the fact that we can't do block devices yet. That's a, another key difference between containers in, and libvirt KVM. But we're, we're, we're looking to, to plug that gap. And I'm going to look at Tycho now, because I'm sure he can think of some more. Tycho, do you want to cut the front? And then if there's any LexD questions, you can, you can answer that. So Linux-only guests. Yeah, so it's Linux-only guests. So of course, you can run a Windows um, image on, under KVM on top of an OpenStack cloud. You can't do that with, uh, with containers. It has to be something that will run on a Linux kernel. So you could run a CentOS container. Obviously, you're going to get the Ubuntu kernel still, so you, you get some propagation of the host OS's kernel down into the, the container as well. So there's, there's some considerations when you're deploying that you, you need to consider. But that's a Right. Another example of an operation. Sorry. Hello. Oh. Uh, another example of an operation that won't work is mount. Um, right now, the super block parsers in the kernel are not considered secure. And so they, they've never had to not trust what was on the super block to begin with. So 
if I'm a bad user, I can craft a nasty super block that will uh, exploit some buffer overflow in the EXD4 parser, and then I have kernel access and I can do bad things. So we, do, we don't trust mount right now, so you have to ask LexD, can you please mount this block device into the container instead of actually mounting it yourself, and there's a lot of tap dancing you have to do to make sure that the user, the container has never been able to write to the block device before it gets mounted because if it has, then they can write the bad file system and bad things happen. So there's, there's a lot of kernel stuff that's, uh, I think, unexplored, and, and we're also interested in looking at that work and making sure that is all safe and secure as well. So, so I've been looking at KVM performance and density for the last few months. I get very, very different results. I get a KVM guess starting at about 150 milliseconds. I get density similar to yours. Have you looked at improving KVM in your OS? Uh, so these are out of the box numbers, right? I think that's the most important part. You install it and you have it. KVM, you've ever seen the QMU command line or whatever, it is sort of infinitely tunable. Um, so there's lots of things that you can do. There's always a trade-off in those, in those places. So you certainly can trim a lot of that stuff and, and do it. The question is, do you want to do it everywhere you go? Right? So, do, do you control the KVM or you kernel or whatever in the cloud or whatever? Right? Can you control those tunables you know, in, in OpenStack yeah. if you're consuming it? But you get 10 times faster on LXD, right? So, because you get 150 milliseconds boot time. You get the same density as you get. So I, but with all the advantages so, of all the So there's a difference between the time it takes for the processes associated with a KVM sentence to be active to the time when you actually have a usable system. Yeah. And that's a significant difference uh, in that I, metric. I know what I that's measure. What, to full hypervisor and full guest OS boot, right? Yeah. That's what you measure as total. Yeah, that's, that's what we've been looking yes. at. It's time to, to usable rather than time to active, if that yeah. makes sense, yeah. Same You're I'm looking measure. at the same thing, right? All right. Could you talk a little bit about the user space uh, management tools like LXC or Libvirt or Nova API? Right. Um, so let me talk a little bit about um, uh, the Lex, uh, LXC. Um, so LexD is a, a REST API web service. Um, and then the command line that they have, uh, LXC, um, connects to that and provides a very um, straightforward interface. So LexC, Verb, different operations, image import, um, update, alias creation. Uh, profile settings, um, but it's all done via REST API, so even the command line client's stalking REST to that, so that makes the integration in, uh, in CLXD, it's using the exact same API to define and create and everything. I'm still trying to understand why I would want to use LXD versus just running either Docker or systemd spawn. So the the graphs and images that you showed, Docker have shown them in the past, etc. So that your density aspect is no different to running any other container technology. Why would I need to add an additional daemon in there? So th this is the difference between machine and process container. Um, you know, Docker's playing very much in that process container space, and that's great. And yeah, the density figures will look very similar because it's all using the same underlying kernel technology ultimately. Um, what we're aiming for is this, you know, the full machine container. So if you have workloads or deployment techniques or whatever it might be that, you know, work with KVM and full machines right now, we're aiming to make those directly transferable without having to re-architect to something more process-centric, um, but still be able to leverage all the lightweight container technology. Does that make sense? I think I understand what yeah. you mean. Okay. <laughs> so a full, full software stack, but condensed into a single container rather than running on a VM. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Some more questions here. It's, yeah, you can't you can't run a custom kernel in the container architecture. It's just not feasible. But you know, we're we're, we're very much targeting that space between process 
container, and, and you know we're aiming for the, the full machine container here. So. Yeah, okay, yeah. As close to full machine you can get without having a separate kernel, yeah. <laughs> What's your current state of integration with Neutron? With Neutron? With this? Mm? Sorry? What's your current state of integration with Neutron? Can we get Neutron networking with this? Absolutely. So um, if you're running the Neutron ML2 OVS reference implementation, uh, that 100% works with, with LexD, with the Nova Compute LexD driver right now. So. Do you guys have any capability to guarantee uh, so you guys show that you can overcommit like no other, but can you guarantee RAM resources or something like that? Yeah, and that, that kind of fits into the, the resource management part of our roadmap. So it's about ensuring that, um, you know, a container that's of a particular flavor type, so, you know, either a single core or a certain memory configuration can only consume those resources on the box and no more. Um, and you know, how, how far you take your overcommit ratio is then, how, you know, based on what, what you think your workload profiles are going to look like. So, you know, how, how, much, how, how too big are people asking their containers to be compared to what their actual memory footprint is going to be. So there's a balance somewhere in there to, to getting your overcommit ratio right. And, and once we have the features in, in terms of limiting um, CPU and memory usage for a container, then that becomes a, a much more integrated solution, which, which should feel much more familiar if you're Familiar operating Nova with KVM. Question on the uh, block storage integration. What's the timeline on that? Um, so I think that's part of our 1510 plan. So that's within the next six months of development. So between now and October. Okay. So okay. Ho hopefully by uh, Japan, we'll have a good story there. Okay. Is there a beta access I can get early access? Or? Uh, not on the block storage yet, but um, all of the LexD and Nova Compute development is done in the open so and we have a PPA for that so yeah, yeah you, uh, can, you can track it yeah. if you're willing to build from source the tr whole tree the Lex D tree is open so uh, you can get it as it comes in okay. so thank you yeah. uh, questions about uh, using a different type of OS like can I have core OS running in the container in LXC it's not possible so you're, you're limited by what you can run on top of a Linux kernel. So uh, CoreOS is Solaris-based. Am I, am I got the right operate? No, I'm not. I don't know. I don't. <laughs> if, uh, if, if, if it's Linux, right, it, it, can, it can run under there, right, if you're not dependent on specific kernel features or whatever. But any other Linux flex that you can run. But in, in LXC, there is a problem, right? We cannot run Fedora image on Ubuntu and stuff like that. So, sorry, I didn't catch you. Can you speak up, please? <coughs> Uh, in case of LXC today, uh, you cannot run a different version of Linux on Ubuntu. Uh, there's some file system uh, incompatibility. So you, sorry, you can't run a different version of Linux, meaning the Linux used like, I can run precise on trusty. Is that? Yeah, um, he was talking about Fedora. Uh, yeah. the other ones. I, I, as like, far as I know, I, as far as I know, those, as work, as I know those work as well. So uh, if you have an issue, I, go ahead and file a bug and, yep. and like, Steve will look at it. That should be supported. Intel announced a clear container, I think, uh, technology. How is that different from LexD, both technically and in the marketplace? So they're using, I think, VMs, uh, but calling it containers. Um, they just have tuned down uh, a lot of the v VTX stuff. I mean, they are the guys who did this silicon, so they really know how it works. Um, for f how it's different from LexD is we're still using the traditional kernel um, virtualization like namespaces and things like that um, I, I think the uh, well the the biggest difference I guess is that they probably can't nest because they have they're using VTX and they have they have these sorts of restrictions KVM. right yeah so um, it's just it's just KVM but like super lightweight I guess they've done a lot of optimization so Question, what kind of uh, hardware assist are you looking at? Hardware assist? Uh, uh, it's, you know, working with the silicon vendors to, you know, it, it'd be in the realm of the, you know, VMX, uh, mm -hmm. you know, v, that, that, those kind of protections that the, they're using. We, we have to be hand wavy, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Still a system being there somewhere, still 
Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's quite a bit. So some of it could be uh, virtual BIOS or whatever. The standard BIOS, I think, it's got like two seconds that it waits no matter what. You can turn it off, but you have to tune it. Um, you're loading the kernel. Um, and I don't have the histogram to break that down um, uh, right here, but, but it's definitely there. The, the big rest of the time is all that, you know, once we're through the kernel, we've done device probing, then we're getting to a NIT and a NIT spawning, you know, lots of more stuff to deal with the fact that it has hardware um, whereas in the container, we don't have a lot. So we go, you know, we're execing a NIT directly, right? And then system D spawns in parallel, we're done. You can, you can, you can tune it down. You really can. I mean, we were going for out of the box numbers, right? You know, saw the package, run the commands. This is what you get. Well, so today we support things like just you give you you can feed us basically a tar file and it has a little metadata file in there that describes you know the personality and things like that um, that the tar file expects and um, I don't know that we have any direct plans to build something to generate those tarballs for you. I think if you like Docker files or whatever, you can generate that tarball however you want and feed it to us, and we'll be happy to launch it in user, user namespaces and do all the security. <clears throat> Excuse me, security for you. Um, well, so we we're going to distribute, you know, the the pre-built pre -built Ubuntu system container images, um, and that's basically because we think that LexD is best suited for system containers. I d I don't think we're competing with Docker. And so I don't think we want to get into a, you know, they, they have a really great story for how to build images and how to share images with people. And, and you know, that, that's very useful for the app container case. For a system container where it's, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to have anything pre-installed. You know, I just want a, an Ubuntu and I want the Ubuntu that the Ubuntu people say is Ubuntu. So there's not a lot of image manipulation that needs to happen there. So I think for, for our use cases, it's not critical. However, we do have this API and you can feed us a tarball that was generated however you want and we'll run it in user namespaces for you. So. Yeah. We're, about, we're about out so of time. I oh, think we have so. to wrap up now. If there's any more questions, yes, then we'll just be outside for up. the break. So. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, great talk. Well done.